So guys, I have a favour. I'm going to be one of these annoying speakers that makes a request. Can everyone on this side of the room come over to this side of the room? I think we can all fit here and it will be a much, much more uh, fun and intimate talk. Um, and that will allow us to make it a bit more of an interactive session. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, so just while, while everyone's moving over, uh, uh, so just a quick show of hands, who's uh, uh, got a Kaggle account? So quite a few. Who's made a submission? A few less. All right. Well, hopefully by the end of this talk, I can motivate those who, who haven't to get, a, get excited about the, um, uh, uh, getting more involved with Kaggle. Um, so what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover a couple of things today. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, uh, to, just to give a very quick introduction to Kaggle for those who aren't familiar. Uh, it'll be very, very quick because um, it sounds like most of you have. Uh, then I'm going to talk a bit about um, some of the unusual things that Kaggle gets exposure to as a result of, we, we're quite a unique company uh, in the data science space, in the machine learning space. And so we see some unique things. And so um, I want to teach you or share with you some of the lessons that we've learned. We've now had over 2 million machine learning models submitted to Kaggle competitions. This is a lot of machine learning. Uh, so you would think there would be some good lessons learned from that. Um, and then some of the exciting things that we're working on that uh, you might find interesting and useful. Um, so first of all, just a very quick introduction to Kaggle. So if you come to our website, you see all these different problems. Uh, they range from uh, trying to take MRIs and diagnose heart failure through to uh, predicting the stock market. So there's a really wide range of problems. Um, all the problems are supervised machine learning problems. They follow a very simple structure, uh, which is roughly that we split the data into training and tests. So people uh, train their algorithms on the training set, and we evaluate them on a test data set. And we actually have a few different configurations, but very often two test, test most, we, we always have two test data sets. One test data set where people get feedback as they submit on a live leaderboard, and another one where the actual uh, competition is scored. And so you can see that the, uh, everyone can see in real time how they're performing relative to each other. And typically you can make up to five entries in a competition per day. Um, we now have a community of uh, 550,000 signed up, um, and then the, the, the nature of the Kaggle community is quite bursty. So if people have time, they'll come in and, and do a competition, then we don't see them for a couple of months, then they come back. So it's not 550,000 that are active in any given month, but we have a, a very large community who, who, who drop in and out depending on their um, availability. And so that gives us... Um, that gives us the chance to, so, so what we, we maintain a ranking system. So anyone who competes on Kaggle is ranked from one to 550,000 based on uh, their performances. And really the ranking system is, is more a fun thing than a, a sort of a true uh, data science rank. Uh, but it gives those who participate act, uh, uh, regularly a, a chance to, um, uh, to, to, you know, to show off and to have a, have a cool credential. Um, now, we've, when, when uh, Kaggle started a, about six years ago now, I, I never would have guessed uh, that, we, we could, that there would be 550,000 people in the world who are interested in machine learning and data science and statistics. Uh, it was really surprising. Um, so a couple of things have happened. One is I think we've been very lucky in terms of timing. So machine learning and data science are a much bigger thing today than they were six years ago, and, and I suspect they'll be a much bigger, bigger thing in, in, uh, in six years' time. But what is it about Kaggle that engages uh, data scientists? How have we been able to build, build such a, a large community? Well, the vast majority of people come to Kaggle to learn. That is by far the number one motivation. So um, it could be that uh, you know, somebody in their job focuses on a certain type of data science and they're interested in getting exposure to different types of problems. It could be that somebody's new to data science and you know, maybe in the first competition they finish 3,000th, but in the next one they finish 2,000th, and it's sort of a way to, for somebody to mark their progress. Um, when you're competing in a competition, you see you, you get a certain score, and then you, you often get exposure to the techniques that won that competition. So it ends up being quite a powerful way to learn at least, the, at least so, some, of the, some of the things that other people are doing uh, that, that, and, and get exposed to new techniques. That's by far the main motivation. Um, also as a credential, so we show up on a lot of CVs now. Not so much our global rankings, but if somebody does well on a competition, um, they'll often put it on, a, on, a, on their CV. And this is something that we're doing a lot of work on at the moment. Uh, ha having Kaggle be uh, more of a, not just kind of a credential, not sort of a fr fun and frivolous credential, but actually a, a real and, and very um, important credential that, that data scientists, uh, that more and more data scientists can use on their CVs. 
Um, and then the final motivation is uh, research. So um, it's, I, I call Kaggle, at, at the risk of being a little bit crude, a really big BS detector. So every time somebody publishes a, a, a machine learning paper, it's always amazingly good and better than all the other algorithms, right, that, that get published. Well, um, Kaggle is a very efficient way to figure out what, what works on, uh, on different types of, um, uh, what works on different types of data sets. So uh, it used to be the case that when Kaggle first started six years ago, Competitions were won by a huge range of techniques, support vector machines, uh, we even saw self-organizing maps, we saw a, a, a really large range of techniques. And then by about 2011, competitions started getting dominated by random forest. Um, so it wasn't that random forest was new in 2011, but the community sort of settled on or realized that random forest was the most powerful way to win the vast majority of uh, machine learning competitions. Um, then in 2012, uh, some researchers from the University of Toronto, so it was uh, George Dahl and, and Jeff, uh, Jeff Hinton won a competition uh, hosted by Merck using a new, well, an old technique rebranded called deep neural networks or deep learning. And so that kind of got our attention a little bit. And then another of uh, Jeff Hinton's grad students, Vlad Min, won another competition uh, using deep neural networks. And so all of a sudden we were seeing um, deep neural networks work on a certain class of competitions, so text, speech, images, and I'll talk more about this later. Um, and then in 2015, we started seeing, um, so we, we had random forest and deep neural networks winning competitions. Then in 2015, Tian Ki Chen, who's a researcher at the University of Washington, uh, uh, created a really nice implementation of gradient boosting machines called XGBoost, and now that's supplanted random forest. So it's, it's a really nice, uh, Kaggle's a very, um, it's, a very, it's a good way for researchers to spread, if they have a technique that really works, it's a, it propagates uh, very quickly through the Kaggle community, because what happens is uh, you are competing in a competition, you finish, uh, I don't know, 800th, and you want to know what the first person did, you pay a lot of attention to their, their techniques. So it's, it, it works out. So if, if you're a, a researcher and you have a new algorithm, it's a good way to, to get attention for it. Um, just a quick, I'm curious, quick show of hands who's heard of XGBoost here? Yeah, quite a lot. OK. Um, by the way, I'm happy to be inter interrupted, so just stick your hand up if you have a question. I'm, I think unlike Carlos, I'm standing out of the light, so I can actually see if you have a question. So feel free to put your hand up. All right. Something is frozen. All right. Um, so um, Kaggle is, so just to give you a sense of the, I mentioned that we've had 2 million machine learning models submitted to Kaggle. Uh, we're at the rate, this is a little bit, uh, needs to be updated, but we're now at the point where we're consistently hitting over 100,000 machine learning models being submitted to Kaggle competitions each month. So there's a lot of machine learning that's happening on, on the site. Um, if you think about it, every single machine learning model takes around about, our estimate is in the order of five to 10 hours. So it's a huge amount of hours going into to competing in these competitions. Um, okay, so as mentioned, uh, we see a lot of machine learning. What, what are some of the lessons that we've learned? So the first one is that competitions end up being a, a really powerful, let's see if I can get the clicker to work so I don't have to keep returning to the laptop. No. Oh, good, okay. Um, so competitions end up being a very powerful way to get everything there is out of a data set. And I want to give you an intuition for, for why this is and, and how this works. So one of our very early competitions was with Na NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab uh, in Pasadena, California. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to uh, algorithm algorithmically detect the ellipticity of galaxies. So they wanted to figure out um, given, a, given a galaxy, can you measure very precisely using image recognition algorithms what the ellipticity of that galaxy is? Now, they use simulated data in this case uh, because it, they needed a real ground truth. Um, and they had techniques that they had been working on for a, they had quite a sophisticated simulator. The techniques that they'd been working on for quite a, a long period of time. Uh, but they, wanted, they, they weren't accurate enough. And they needed to be very, very accurate because the, the use case of this problem is if, you're, um, if, if there's dark matter between the observer and the galaxy, it will distort the ellipticity of the galaxy. And so uh, the, the utility of this algorithm is being able to, if they can measure very precisely the ellipticity, that they can back out of that the dark matter distribution of the universe. So they needed very accurate algorithms. And what they had wasn't accurate enough. Now, very interesting, the first entrant in this competition was a glaciologist by the name of Martin O'Leary. Uh, and so what Martin did was he, 
he, he used algorithms that he had built for his glaciology research. He did a lot of image recognition in his glaciology research. What he would do is he would take satellite images and measure algorithmically where the edges of glaciers were. So Martin uh, got into first place and uh, had actually, in a relatively short period of time, less than a week, had outperformed uh, the best of NASA's uh, approaches. Um, and so Jason Rhodes, who was the investigator at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, posted this on the NASA, on the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy blog. And he said, um, the world's brightest physicists have been working for decades on solving one of the great unifying problems of our universe. In less than a week, Martin O'Leary, a PhD student in glaciology, uh, had outperformed the state-of-the-art algorithms. So this is a fabulous result. If you look inside the, the text of this uh, blog post, um, you can see they referenced Einstein's theory of relativity, they mentioned Newton's law of gravity, they're explaining the concept of dark matter and why this problem's important. So Martin has both a, a Twitter account and a sense of humour, and so what he did was he got on Twitter and he said, not that I'm bragging or nothing, but the White House has just compared me to Einstein and Newton, so he was, <laughs> he was quite pleased. Um, but he doesn't stay pleased for very long, because what happens is then somebody passes him, and then Martin passes them, and they pass him, and he passes them, and eventually you get to this point where nobody is able to get any, th there's no, no more improvements that anyone's really making. I mean, maybe there's, there's, there's very slight improvements, but really there's only so much signal in a data set, and you get to the point where you've really extracted all the signal uh, out of the data set. Um, so that's the, it's, it's one of the things that competitions are very powerful for. Now, what we've noticed, though, is that different competitions converge at different rates, and sometimes we don't run our competitions for quite long enough, because you can see these are the competitions broken out by decile. We've normalized the evaluation metric, so it's, it's always the higher the better. Uh, and you can see this is a bottom decile competition. Um, you can see that it's still going up. It probably hasn't converged. Uh, and then these are some of the easier problems where they converge very quickly. Any questions before I go on? Yep. How do you estimate how easy the problem is? Um, we're getting better at it, but it's, it's, um, it's really quite difficult. So the question, uh, I don't know if everyone could hear the question, but the question was how do we estimate how easy a problem is? Um, in some ways, we, we, the only reason we need to is because we need to set a time, right? But we want to host a competition for the shortest time possible uh, because most of the work that's going on through here is, is just like adding complexity without really adding much performance. So the ideal is to, is to cut off a competition pretty close to, to when the, the, that limit has been reached. Um, or conversely, making sure we don't leave a problem, we don't shut a problem down too quickly, um, which you can see we have done in a, in, a, in a bunch of cases. And one limitation we face is it's not, we can't change the rules midway through a competition. It's really unfair to participants, so we, we will not do that. Uh, so we do our best up front um, uh, to estimate. Um, and so typically we run competitions between two and four months. Uh, two months for the easier competitions, four months for the harder competitions. And I think what we're going to do as a result of an analysis like this is some of the really hard competitions will extend out to six months. Um, you know, there's obviously a bit of a trade-off between maintaining people's attention. Uh, you know, after a while, a certain amount of time on a competition becomes less interesting and people want to move on to another competition, but also making sure that we're not cutting it off too soon. Any other questions? Yep. So, so, so the question was, is there any, uh, what, what determines, well, what's the theoretical limit? The theoretical limit is really, um, in any data set, there's signal and there's noise, right? Uh, so there are things you can predict uh, using the state of the art of machine learning and things you can't. Um, and so the limit really is, like data science, machine learning is not magic. You, you have richness and you have noise in your data. Uh, and if you've, competitions are a powerful way to get, to find the signal out of, um, out of data sets. Now, for a lot of the more numerical data sets, my sense is that the limitation is, um, is more on the richness of the data. So the techniques are quite strong. Um, it's a case of there just isn't a lot of, you can't do better because there's, there's, there's not more richness in the data. Some of the text, speech, um, and image-based uh, competitions, I think in a lot of cases, it's actually limitations of the state of the art of machine learning. So if you think about it like this, um, for image recognition competitions before deep learning, uh, 
the, the, the limit was, was much higher. Um, and so as, as we are developing uh, newer and newer techniques that, you know, what, what is the, the limit of what we can do um, uh, moves. Actually interesting, um, we have this opportunity, we haven't done it, but we, something that would be interesting for us to do is to take a competition that, that deep learning or deep neural networks is very good at and rerun it. Uh, now that we have these new techniques, it, it's a good way to give us a sense for kind of what the, what the delta is uh, on, the, on a problem. Any other questions before I move on? Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So people people use uh, deep learning wins all the text, image, and some of the speech. Sorry, all the t image competitions, computer vision competitions, uh, all the ones with speech and t and audio, and some of the text competitions. People can use whatever they want, and so that's why I say Kaggle is a good bullshit detector because. Um, you know, an academic paper can say this is by far, this is the world's best technique at doing X, Y, Z. Well, if it wins competitions, you have sort of an objective uh, uh, sense of what that, whether that's true or not. So people are not restricted in what they use. Um, okay, so this opens a question. How do we know that we've hit the limit of what's possible uh, on, a, um, on a data set or on a competition? Well, very often when we've hit the limit, you start to see correlation maps that look like this. So what is this? First of all, I should explain this, um, this chart. So the top left is the correlation between the first and second placed entry, the first and third placed entry, the first and fourth placed entry. Um, so what, what we've done is we've taken the submission file and looked at you know, how similar the submission files are. And you can see this is pretty bright red, right? The correlation between first and second all the way through to first and, and 19th or first and 20th is, is pretty much um, uh, almost at one. And so what this is telling you is that people are getting all the same things right and all the same things wrong. Um, and you know when people are getting all the same things right and all the same things wrong, they probably have reached that, that limit, right? Um, so it's, it's more corroborating evidence that uh, given the state of the art of machine learning and, and, uh, and what you can pull out of the data, there is a, a limit. Um, now, I'm going to show you a competition where we didn't converge. This is a competition for the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. And what they wanted to do was predict which, uh, uh, basically uh, build an algorithm that could solve an eighth grade science quiz. So this is an example of a question. So the human eye has receptors that can detect, detect which part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So show of hands, who thinks it's A, B, C? And lots of people think it's C, D, you're all right. Um, and all the algorithms got this question right as well. Um, but this, the colors aren't showing up here, but you can see this correlation map is a very different color. People are getting dramatically, there's a big difference in the things that people are getting right and the things that people are getting wrong for this question, which is for this competition, which is a sign that it, it, it did not converge. Um, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of an art in, in inter like a lot of machine learning and, and data science, there's a little bit of an art in interpreting this because um, this competition also got a lower overall score. So the actual, um, the actual overall score was dramatically lower uh, than, than, um, the, than the NASA competition. So some, sometimes people get, the things that people are getting wrong are, they're getting, or, or Sometimes people are getting, if you get a lot of things wrong, sometimes you get them right by accident. It's a multiple choice uh, test. So that will naturally lower the correlation, but not to this extent. Um, so this is an, a question that uh, half the, half the um, algorithms got correct and half the algorithms got incorrect. So you can see that change, so this is a, a motion with accelerated speed uh, and motion with constant speed are represented by different equations. Uh, which of the following best describes motion with accelerated speed? So half the algorithm said changes in velocity over time, and the other half said time over changes in velocity, right? So you can see what's happening here. This was uh, the, the winning techniques used an informational retrieval-based approach, and informational retrieval-based approaches are basically looking for words that kind of correlate acceleration, changes in velocity, time. Um, uh, those words correlate with acceleration, and so, but the algorithms weren't smart enough to really understand the meaning, so they they were just basically word matching, right? So you learn something about the limits of machine learning um, or the techniques that were used in this competition from the things that people get wrong. Question? Uh, I'm just curious, curious, how, how much, what percentage of the general population get this question? <laughs> I, I would say it's, so, well, here's a way to think about it. So the winning algorithms in this competition scored 60% on the test. Um, and so good humans obviously 
you would expect, uh, I don't know how difficult the test was, but um, I don't know what the average score for humans is on the test, but I suspect certainly good students are getting a lot higher than 60%. So the algorithms are not, are not performing that well on um, at least when we cut the competition off, the algorithms were not performing that well. Any other questions? Okay. So I'm going to show you one that all the algorithms got wrong. And this one's hard. Uh, in many types of bacteria, offspring receive all their genes from a single parent. These types of bacteria, I'm trying to figure out whether to try and embarrass the audience and ask for, uh, take a poll for this one. Uh, I, I won't. Uh, so A, produce very little offspring, pass on RNA rather than DNA, do not have different sexes, receive DNA from, from either the father or the mother. So the actual answer is C, and most of the algorithms said either A, with some saying D. And again, it's something about information retrieval re uh, based responses. So you see the word parent, offspring kind of correlates with parents, or father and mother correlates with parent. Um, uh, you know, that to, to get to this answer, you have to have a deeper level of understanding than these algorithms had. So the, the, the message here is it's, it's quite, you learn a lot about um, machine learning by starting and what, what, what machines are good at and what they're not good at by looking at um, across all the submissions to a competition, what are people getting right and what are they getting wrong? Um, there is also this opportunity to on so, so if you haven't reached the frontier, what you can do is you can start to combine, because they're not getting all the same things right and the same things wrong, you have this opportunity to ensemble top models together and get a better performance. So I said to you earlier that the best algorithm, single algorithm, was actually 59.3%, so not quite 60%. Uh, uh, if you ensemble models um, 1 to 5, you get 61.6%. Now, there are much smarter ensembling schemes than just a flat average, but this is just a naive approach uh, to ensembling. Um, you can't really see this. This is not showing, the color's not showing up here, but if I do something a little bit smarter, so I just look at first and second and the models that they're least correlated with and ensemble those, you see I, I get an even bigger boost, so 62.7%. So when we have hit the frontier, there's no opportunity to ensemble. When we haven't hit the frontier, you can start to ensemble the models together and get even better performances because some of the models are doing well in some areas and some are doing better in other areas. Um, and then finally, this is a competition that I'm particularly proud of. This is to take MRIs and diagnose heart failure. So you can see this is a, this is a heart, it's beating. Um, in order to measure heart failure, what a, a cardiologist will do is they'll measure something called ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is the ratio of the um, volume of the left ventricle when it's small versus when it's big. Um, and so what, what the algorithm is doing is you can see it's marking when the so D stands for diastolic, S stands for systolic. I think systolic is when it's small, diastolic is when it's big. Um, and so what the algorithm is doing is it's identifying when the heart is full and when it's empty. Uh, and then it's, it's got a circle around the left ventricle. And so it's measuring the volume and then it's, it's giving us a, a measure of ejection fraction. So this is something that is very tedious for a cardiologist to do. It takes them 20 minutes and it's not very fun. Um, I forgot to mention, the, 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 it takes them 20 minutes, partly because this is one angle, but they, the, the MRI takes photos at 30 different angles because it cares about volume, right? Uh, so this is something that a, a machine learning algorithm was able to do as accurately as a human. Now, one of the really interesting things about this was um, if you look at the correlation map, there are two different approaches that seem to be doing well, right? So first, second, third, fourth are all pretty highly correlated with each other, fifth, eighth, and 10th are not very highly correlated with each other. Uh, and you can see, sorry, not very co highly correlated with first, but they are highly correlated with each other. Uh, so it turns out that, um, uh, that the, those teams used a technique called active appearance models. So it's, a, it's another technique um, uh, uh, that could do almost as well as the winning technique on this problem. So it tells you that there were actually two solutions. Um, lesson number three. So two approaches are really dominating competi Kaggle competitions. I've already mentioned them, uh, but I'm going to go over them at, uh, in, in slightly more depth. So the first is, um, is what I call the hand-rolled feature approach. And this is using the X XGBoost. Almost everybody is using XGBoost. So what they're doing, first of all, is exploring the data. So looking at correlation maps and, and scatter plots and histograms and exploring the data every which way to try and get an understanding of what's in the underlying data set. Um, then they come up with a hypothesis. So the hypothesis uh, that I like, um, or the example I like is the, uh, the uh, orange car example. So 
we hosted a competition to predict which cars sold at second-hand auction would be good buys and which would be lemons, so which would have a warranty claim against them. And it turned out that the winner found that um, unusual colour cars were more likely to be reliable than standard colour cars. And the way they found this was they took car colour and they grouped dark colour cars with light colour cars. They grouped um, unusual colour cars with standard colour cars and they tried lots and lots of different ideas and then they, they looked at the ones that really did have a, have a genuine relationship. And then once they'd come up with their features, they'd put them in XG Boost. So most, the vast majority of the work is actually exploring the data, coming up with hypotheses, testing those hypotheses, uh, and then actually tuning the hyperparameters is really not, it's not where the majority of the benefit comes from. It, most of the benefit is in exploring the data, coming up with clever ideas about the data, testing them. Um, the other technique that's doing well in competitions is, is deep neural networks, which is quite the opposite. So you spend very little time uh, doing feature engineering and much more time constructing your neural network. So uh, convolutional neural networks are dominating image recognition competitions. Uh, you can see on the left we have uh, images of the eye, and this was to diagnose an eye disease called diabetic retinopathy. These are the eyes that have been pro processed by a uh, convolutional neural network. This eye has a rating of zero, so it's perfectly healthy. This eye has a rating of four, so if you have a rating of four on your diabetic retinopathy scan, you are blind, uh, and you can have a zero, one, two, three, four. If you have a one or two, you're, on, you're developing diabetic retinopathy, you can have surgery, uh, either a laser surgery or an injection, and it will be cured. Um, so it's, it's quite an important disease to catch early. Um, and you see what convolutional neural networks do is they basically do sort of complex edge, or they do um, sophisticated edge detection. So it's, it's, they sort of pull out the, the features of the eye. Um, the other type, the other flavor of deep neural networks that we've seen do very well are recurrent neural networks. So these work well on time series problems or problems that have a sequencing dimension to them. So we've done quite a few competitions on EEGs, so uh, grasp, grasping or lifting. Um, uh, is one example. So can you tell whether somebody is grasping or lifting from their EEG signals? We've also done competitions around can you predict in advance whether or not somebody's going to have a seizure based on their EEG readings. So recurrent neural networks dominate these competitions. Um, interestingly with the text, so natural language processing text, um, we see a bit of a mix. So we sometimes see information retrieval or the hand-rolled features approach winning text problems and sometimes we see uh, neural networks, but it's not, it's not clear, like there's not, it's not nearly as clear as it is for images uh, that, that uh, deep neural networks are dominating. So to give you some examples, um, I don't have an example, but uh, a, uh, a deep neural network won a competition to take the text of job ads and predict the salary, right? So this was for a job classified site in the UK. They wanted to take the text of a job ad and, and get a sense for what the benchmark salary would be. Um, and a deep neural network won that. Uh, on the flip side, that eighth grade science quiz uh, example that I gave you earlier, um, it was won by an information, information retrieval based approaches. So we really are seeing a mix. Any questions before I move on? No. Okay. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about the attributes uh, of top Kaggle participants. So really they have four characteristics. One is creativity, so being able to come up with lots and lots of different kind of ideas, features, um, uh, is, um, is something that, uh, you know, being able to come up with dark color cars versus light color cars, orange, car, unusual color cars versus standard color cars. So coming up with lots of ideas is an important characteristic. Um, secondly, tenacity. So you're in first place and then somebody passes you and you pass them and they pass you and it's, it's quite, you know, but not, being, not getting dispirited um, when, when others are passing on the leaderboard, but, but going, going and, and, and reimagining what else you could do uh, takes a lot of tenacity. And so we notice that's a characteristic of a lot of top Kagglers. Um, the second is uh, very good with statistics. So one thing that we see a lot, this is a, the story of Gregory Park. So he, um, remember I said we have two test data sets. One test data set is the test data set that we show you how you're doing on the live leaderboard as the, as the competition is going, and then we throw that away and we retest you to make sure you're not overfitting. And so a lot of first-time Kagglers, what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll think they're doing really well, they'll, have, they'll be on the top of the leaderboard, um, and they'll be, they'll be very excited. And, and what happens is we flip the, when the, the deadline for a competition is midnight UTC, and so what we do is we flip from the public leaderboard to the final actual leaderboard, uh, at midnight UTC, and so Gregory Park would have been uh, staying up, 
and he's hitting refresh, refresh, refresh on his keyboard. He's very excited. He thinks he's won the competition. And he's not in first, and he's not in second, and he's not in third. He keeps scrolling down the page. He finished 50th. Well, he overfit to the, uh, to the public leaderboard. And I tell you what, he will never overfit again. It's a very, very good way to learn the lesson of overfitting. Um, but it happens a lot. Um, and the amount that it happens on Kaggle makes me, it just makes you wonder as you read research papers, as you um, look at algorithms in production, this is a case where we have the test data set quarantined, so it's actually not really possible to overfit. Most cases, that isn't the case. So it makes me wonder how, much, how prevalent overfitting is in the real world uh, outside of uh, this world of Kaggle competitions where we can actually control for it. So I think it's a really big problem. And so one of, one of, you know, I think about the contributions the world Kaggle has made, one of them that I think is actually quite a valid, valuable one is uh, people who compete in Kaggle competitions know about overfitting and learn techniques for, for protecting against it. And I think that it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly valuable um, uh, lesson for people to learn. Uh, and just more generally, being able to st really test uh, when you have a relationship and when you don't. Uh, and then finally, version control and, and good software practices more generally. So I would say most top Kagglers are using good software practices, so version control being an obvious one. Um, not everybody, but the people who do well in Kaggle competitions and aren't using good software practices are probably spending about five times as long on the competition. Um, because what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to keep track of the things you've done that work and the things that, that you've done that don't work, um, and, and dismiss the things that don't work and, and keep the things that do work. Um, so this is the weakest of the four uh, characteristics of top Kagglers, but, but uh, if you're not using it, co competing in competition is going to be a lot less fun and a lot more work. Um, so I think I still have a little bit of time, and I'm going to end off with something that I think, I hope, uh, you all find interesting and useful. So um, where next for Kaggle? So Kaggle is currently the place where uh, data scientists come for their side projects. And historically, it's all been around competing in competitions. Um, we, would also, we would like to uh, be much, a much bigger part of a data scientist's uh, daily life. And so we've been de developing a set of uh, an environment that, that, um, that is aimed at, at, at helping data scientists in, in more ways um, uh, than we currently do. So I'm going to show you a demo. Uh, I'm going to start by motivating the problem. So one thing that we notice is that hang on, we have forums. So this is a competition. Very, this is a simple getting started competition. For, so for anyone who's new to Kaggle, we have lots of these getting started competitions. They're very easy, um, and they're a good way to get going. And, uh, and then you'll get addicted, and then you'll, before, before long, you'll be diagnosing heart failure. Um, Okay, so you'll notice here, this is one of our getting started competitions. Lots of very uh, friendly, or well, often friendly communities sharing lots and lots of uh, tips and tricks. Um, and one of the things people are sharing is they're sharing code. So this person is sharing their neural network code. Uh, in order to get it running, you need the same version of Python. It's, it's written in Python. You need the same libraries. You need Pandas, Scikit-Learn, Matplotlib, NumPy, NoLearn, and Lasagna. You need the same versions of those libraries maybe. Uh, you need the same data. And so this person has generally see, really shared their code, but no one's really discussing it. No one's done anything with it. It's just like a hassle. It's probably maybe half an hour's work to get his code running. You don't even know what, what you'll get once you run it. Um, so what we have launched is this nice little environment called Scripps. We also give you a notebook environment where oops, you can see you get an R, a Python, or a Julia environment. The data is automatically read in. And you can just start coding immediately. You hit run script. Uh, and we don't charge for it. But the condition is that all the shit code that you, uh, that you share is shared publicly. So this is just taking a minute to load. You can see all the examples of code that people have shared. So the highest, I've ordered by votes. The highest voted script is um, a TensorFlow deep neural network. So a lot of people, TensorFlow is the Google deep neural network library. So a lot of people are interested in it. Um, I'm going to show you a different one, though. This, this one I particularly like. So this is somebody has written a random forest to visualize the digits and the proximity of the digits to each other. So you can see the sevens are near each other, the nines are near each other, the sevens are near the nines. So this algorithm is sort of working as you would expect. It's classifying the digits and grouping them close to each other. In red are the ones he's getting wrong. He's consistently getting the sevens with the dashes through them wrong. You can see this one that thinks is a nine. It's right near the nines. Let's say I wanted to improve on his code. 
I just hit fork script. I get his code running in an environment that, that will execute his code. There's no faffing about with the environment. And I can just start editing his code immediately. So um, if you compare this, so I showed you the example where somebody had sh shared their neural network code before. If you compare this with the other example, um, this has been forked 32 times. So it's been the, it, it, just making it friction. So two things are going on here. One is we're making it frictionless to build off what somebody else has done. And the other nice thing about it is you see what you get. You see what the output is before you spend time uh, playing with it. Um, and so it turns out that just lowering the frictions in being able to build off what somebody else has done makes a big difference. Now, most of our competitions have scripts enabled. And so it's kind of like a way for people to share tips and tricks and code as they're um, competing in a competition. So if you're newer to data science, you'll see lots of getting started examples of how to get started in this competition. We can just fork the code and edit it immediately. So it's easier to start with somebody else's code than with a blinking cursor. And if you're more advanced, but you want to learn a new library or a new technique, you know, a lot of the Tian Ki Chen, for instance, the creator of XGBoost, spends a lot of time in here you know, creating examples of how to use XGBoost for this competition or that competition. And so you, see, you get to see how experts use libraries that you, um, you may not be familiar with. Uh, so it's a good way to learn libraries. The other thing we're starting to do is we're starting to allow people to use scripts for things beyond uh, just um, uh, competitions. So we've, we've launched public data sets on Kaggle now. So this is an acknowledgement that we have a community of 550,000 people. Not everyone wants to be competing in competitions. Not everyone has the time. People want to do more exploratory type analysis or different type of analysis that is not that competitions are not useful for or not, not, not encouraging of. Um, so I'll show an example. One of the data sets we have up are Hillary Clinton's emails. So if I go in. And you can see all the scripts that have been written on Hillary's emails. And the one I like is this person did sentiment analysis. As you can see, his code. He's done sentiment analysis on Hillary's emails. And you can see uh, Hillary turns out not to be that keen on Iraq. And actually, surprisingly, um, not, not so crazy about the United Kingdom either. Uh, she doesn't like it, Libya. Um, so. Um, and again, this has been forked 14 times. So at the moment, uh, we have probably about 25 data sets up. What we're actually doing, uh, by the end of the, probably by the end, in the next couple of weeks, um, anyone will be able to upload their own data set. So let's say you're, um, you're working on a research paper and you're working with other researchers, or you've just finished a research paper, but you want to make the, the code and the data um, public and reproducible by others, uh, you, can, you can load it on here and, and you'll have a very large audience of people to play with your, uh, your data set. Um, and further out, this will become something that, uh, you know, people, there's a, we have a lot of work to do on it, but it'll be something that um, uh, we'll probably make available to companies as well that want to share it among their data science teams. So it's, it's at the moment a really good resource for Getting to, getting to play with lots of different data sets, whether they be public data sets or competitions, see other people's code, learn from other people's code, um, teach other people uh, tricks that you know that they don't know. Uh, so it's a, a really, be become a really popular addition to Kaggle and a very good learning resource. Um, so with that, I may have time, do I have time for one more question or are we, uh, yeah, I do, okay, I've got time for a question. No. Yep. Yeah, so for that, um, it depends. So uh, for different competitions, there are different rules. Uh, and it depends on the competition host. So for the eighth grade science quiz competition, uh, the Allen Institute allowed people to bring in any source. What they th think they packaged up Wikipedia data, the science, science articles um, from Wikipedia. It's actually interesting. Uh, most of the top performers brought in other data sets. And the data sets that were most useful, it turned out, were not like the Wikipedia corpus, but like flashcard data and textbook. Or I think it was flashcard data was very popular and, and very useful, um, which was quite, quite interesting and probably an endorsement. I think one of the companies for, from uh, the, one of the companies whose data was taken or was used extensively, extensively was a company called Quizlet. So it's probably actually quite a good uh, endorsement of their, um, their material. At the back. It also seemed like there was sort of like a bifurcation of domains with those 
uh, applied, like the neural nets worked with unstructured data, and the XGBoost like worked with ultimately data that was like a little bit more structured. Like, like, would you say those are actually alternatives that come up in problems, or it's more like some problems get dominated by strategy one, and other problems get dominated by strategy two? I actually think the way you expressed it is perfectly right. So, uh, XGBoost tends to win um, uh, the structured data problems and and the feature heavy feature engineering approach, uh, and deep neural networks win images, speech, uh, and then the one kind of murky example again is text. So text is, you know, sometimes text problems, uh, like an information retrieval based approach is, is really um, a hand rolled feature approach. Uh, and we see that winning some text problems and in other ones we do see recurrent neural networks. So that's, that's the one that sort of fits a little in the middle. I think I'm out of time now, um, but uh, thanks very much. Okay, the next uh, talk will be at...